Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. We're going to wait just another minute for folks to join, and then we'll get started. See if folks are still joining for the sake of time, thinking we should get underway. Thanks again for joining the webinar today. This is the next edition of the webinar series entitled Conversations on Ocean Carbon, a U.S. West Coast and Alaska Perspective. This webinar series aims to deliver the best available information on marine carbon dioxide removal, MCDR, and to explore concepts related to coastal ocean carbon. Through this webinar series, we're working together to create a dialogue among industry members, tribes, natural resource managers, and scientists throughout the U.S. West Coast and Alaska to provide a better understanding of MCDR technologies, the state of the science, and to create ways to become more engaged in this emerging field. Thanks to those of you who have joined our previous webinars and those recordings can be found on YouTube. My name is Alex Harper. I'm the Deputy Director with the Central and Northern California Ocean Observing System, a Climate Resilience Specialist with California Sea Grant and the Coordinator for the California Current Acidification Network, or CCAM. CCAN is an interdisciplinary collaboration among scientists, resource managers, industry members, and others from local, state, and federal agencies dedicated to advancing the understanding of ocean acidification and its effects on our biological resources across the West Coast. This webinar series is co-hosted by CCAN, the Alaska Ocean Acidification Network, and California Ocean Science Trust. And from those organizations, I have here my co-host for today, Darcy Dugan with the Alaska Ocean Observing System and OA Network, Laura Linsmeyer from the California Ocean Science Trust. And we're also supported today by Alexandra Puritz from NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program. Lauren and Emma Stone from California Ocean Science Trust will be working behind the scenes to make sure today's webinar runs smoothly. During today's webinar, attendees will be in listen-only mode. You can type your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we'll pose the questions to the speaker af speakers after their presentations during the Q&A portion of today's webinar. We are also recording this session and the recording will be available on YouTube. The title of today's session is Assessing the Effectiveness of Marine Carbon Dioxide Removal, Measurement, Reporting, and Verification of Ocean Alkalinity Enhancement. And we are joined by our three esteemed panelists, Richard Feely, Yui Takashida, and Matt Long. We'll have 90 minutes for today's webinar with 15 to 20 minute presentations and followed by the moderated Q&A. Before we get started, we'd like to ask a poll question to get a sense of the audience interest and relationship to MPDR. You should be able to see the poll question now. What best describes your relationship with MCDR? We'll give folks a moment to respond. 
and I can't see the responses. So Lauren or Emma, when you think we have a good number of, okay, great. So many of you are already part of an active MCDR project. And similarly, a uh, number are not involved in MCDR, but are interested to learn more. So sort of a, a mixed group. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining again. Now to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Richard Feely. Dr. Feely is a senior scientist and project lead at the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab in Seattle in the CARBON program. He's been with PMEL for over 48 years, authoring more than 350 scientific research pu publications with over a thousand days at sea, 50 scientific expeditions, and leads the West Coast Ocean Acidification Cruises. He received his PhD in chemical oceanography from Texas A&M. I'm going to pass it to you for your presentation. Please turn on your camera and share your screen. Can you see my slides and hear me okay? Yes, looks great. All right. Well, Thank you, Alex, and, and thank you for the, the California Current Acidification Network and organizers to support this important uh, presentation today. My name is Richard Feely from the Pacific Green Environmental Laboratory, which is the NOAA Laboratory in Seattle. And I want to thank my co-authors, Jessica Cross, Nina Benarczyk, and Nicholas Gruber, for helping me prepare this presentation. So first thing I'm gonna do is to show uh, the take home messages. And I think this is critical to start this discussion. And what we're trying to do is to develop a MERV effort, uh, um, monitoring, reporting and verification that starts out with model simulations to de delineate the concentration changes that we might expect to see. And, and, and of course, uh, we'll see a presentation on that in a few minutes. Integrate the model with dedicated observational programs. Excuse me for a second. Integrate the model with the dedicated observational program that includes observations in the field, at the experimental site, and then at a control site so that you can compare the two. Compare the results with background observations, both models and measurements, and integrate that uh, through uh, data integration and reporting through the National Centers for Reporting uh, uh, Observational Data, and delineate these changes to uh, changes due to both natural and human impacts over the course of the experiment. Now, as a background, of course, we all understand that as CO2 exchanges across the air-sea interface, it re reacts with water to form bicarbonic, uh, carbonic acid, and then that carbonic acid dissociates almost immediately to form a hydrogen ion, which causes the acidification of the ocean, and a bicarbonate ion. And that hydrogen ion can then react with carbonate and decrease the concentration of carbonate ions uh, in seawater, causing significant impacts our, to our calcifying organisms. The, the ocean alkalinity enhancement effort tries to re reverse those equations to add more carbonate to seawater and therefore drive the system to take uh, to allow more CO2 to be removed from the atmosphere because of the increased carbonate ion that can take up the CO2. So that's the basic science behind what we're trying to accomplish here. Now, if you look at the concentrations of anthropogenic CO2 over the course, course of the, from the pre-industrial period to the present, we can see that the, it was about um, 280 
petagrams of carbon that have been have increased in the atmosphere and 180 have increased in the oceans thus far. And the oceans have a very strong capacity to take up more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so we, the approach that we're taking with ocean alkalinity enhancement is to enhance that uptake of carbon dioxide within the oceans, and then it can draw more carbon dioxide down uh, from the atmosphere. And we know that the oceans presently take up about 20% of all the anthropogenic CO2 over the past 272 years. The approaches that have been discussed for marine carbon dioxide removal is coastal blue carbon. This is enhancing the biological activity in coastal waters to take up more carbon and bury it in the sediments. Ocean alkalinity enhancement, which we're going to talk about today, which is releasing uh, carbonate ion concentrations or sodium hydroxide into the waters to take up more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or interactions that may take place in rivers and coastal environments that release uh, carbonate ion into those waters, then which are mixed in the oceans and take up more carbon. Other approaches are like ion fertilization and macro algae cultivation, which try to enhance productivity in the open ocean and enhance the uptake of carbon in organic matter and its subsequent burial in marine sediments. If we look at the IPCC AR6 report on, on the various um, CO2 emission scenarios, we can see what the impact will be on our oceans. So in the left-hand pa panel is the different CO2 scenarios for uh, atmospheric concentrations. In the right-hand panel, the center panel on the top side is the resulting ocean carbon sink, and it increases from its present level of almost three petagrams of carbon. And in the different scenarios can go up as high as six petagrams per carbon per year. But you can see in that bottom center panel is that the storage of ocean carbon will continue to increase throughout the rest of this century under any uh, scenario that we have, because you're still taking up carbon into the oceans. So for, CO, for this excess CO2 that's in the atmosphere, we need to reduce carbon emissions as quickly as we can. And in addition to that, if we're going to get, drop below the two degrees centigrade uh, Paris agreements, we need to enhance the, the carbon uptake uh, th through net zero emissions uptake uh, either on land or by taking CO2 out of the atmosphere or in the oceans by taking up carbon dioxide uh, in, the, in the oceans and enhancing that removal process that naturally occurs. Now, the kinds of estimates that have been made thus far about how much carbon dioxide would have to be removed by marine carbon dioxide or atmospheric carbon dioxide removal amounts to about uh, up to as much as 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year in, uh, in, by 2050, and almost up to about 17 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year in 2100. So that calls for a very strong uh, carbon dioxide removal program on land and in the oceans, and it, it emphasizes the fact that we need to get started as soon as possibly can. Now, taking a step backwards for a moment, we can go back to the previous presentation by Andrew Dixon, and it, it shows how ocean alkalinity enhancement worked. So the one approach is using um, sodium hydroxide, hydroxide uh, input by electrolysis and other procedures. And the advantage of that sodium hydroxide input is this, the hydroxide immediately reacts with carbon, uh, carbon dioxide and produces more um, carbonate ion. And so those reactions take place. The effect is that there is um, no increase in the carbon dioxide, con total carbon dioxide concentration. There is an immediate increase in the alkalinity uh, concentration as shown by the red line up here. So it's a very strong enhancement of the total uh, carbonate ion concentration 
from the reaction with sodium hydroxide. In the second panel, you see another approach, and this is approaches by adding um, calcium carbonate into the ocean, releasing carbonate ions. And in that case, you increase the alkalinity by twice as much alkalinity as there is an increase in total carbonate ion concentration, which also increases the alkalinity, but it also uh, increases the saturation state of seawater with respect to aragonite and calcite. And the third approach, approach in the bottom is by adding sodium bicarbonate ion. And the sodium bicarbonate approach adds alkalinity and al adds uh, total carbon dioxide. In doing so, though, the pH stays about the same. And uh, the, there is very, very little change over with the increasing uh, uh, bicarbonate to the, the pH of seawater. So each different approach has a different effect on the chemistry of seawater. I, I'm having trouble with changing the slides. All right, next slide. So what our approach has been is to develop a very strong modeling effort, as you can see here, and the modeling community has done an excellent job of having a strong biogeochemical model that can predict what the changes will be as we add these additions. Uh, concerning the mixing and the biological processes. And we combine that with an observing system that can provide the, the changes that are taking place against a background of uh, concentrations that would naturally be in place. So we compare a control system with a experimental system and identify those changes that are taking place due to ocean alkalinity enhancement. And as you can see in this right-hand pa panel, we have a number of different approaches to do that. Most high quality measurements are taken from ships uh, collecting water samples, bringing on board ships and analyzing them. We also have a number of autonomous sensors that take place, autonomous samples that occur on moorings, floats and guiders. And more recently, we've been developing approaches to measure concentration on, on autonomous vehicles such as sail drone and wave glider. So we have a number of different approaches that we can take to observe the changes that are taking place and compare that with the model results. Now, against the backdrop of the global carbon observing system, we can also use the information that is derived from the global carbon observing system to obtain the baseline conditions for any experimental take place. And this is a, a representation of what the global carbon observing system is for surface measurements. It's the SOCAT uh, observing system. And th that represents uh, measurements that are made on board research vessels and, and ships of opportunity. There is also the, the uh, GOAN observing network that includes more coastal observations as well as the open ocean observations. And in addition to that, uh, there is the GLODEP observational program. This is a uh, ghost ship. And, and, and uh, again, the GOAN network, which allows surface to bottom measurements throughout the open ocean and in our coastal waters. And then that provides a very strong background, which can provide information up to date on what the background concentrations will be. For the localized regions here, for example, along the West Coast, as, as Alex said earlier, our West Coast OH monitoring system and consists of uh, cruises, moorings, and glider observations. And Yui will talk about a little bit more detail about that in a moment. Now, in addition to that, we have the uh, global ocean uh, monitoring effort with uh, profiling floats and right now, the profiling floats that measure temperature, salinity, and oxygen, and a fraction of those also measure biogeochemical parameters, are making over 1 million observations per day. And that, those can be incorporated into the models to give you a good understanding of what the background concentrations might be. Now, conceptually, what we have had is... Uh, an approach where we've combined the moorings, the surface measurements with satellites, 
the decadal hydrographic observations, volunteering observations, and research cruises. And you can see the moorings provide detailed information over short space and tempo scales, all the way to the uh, decadal hydrographic cruises, which provide broad scale observations, but only at decade level uh, tempo changes. Now, when we look at the same piece of information on in terms of what this looks like within the depth of the water column, you can see that there are significant gaps in, in our resolution at the uh, from the regional scale to the global scale. And these gaps need to be filled in, in both in space and time. So more recently, we have been developing the uh, uh, four BGC floats and, and, and deep floats, Argo floats, plus steerable profilers that uh, uh, profile throughout the water column and provide us much more detailed temporal and spatial information for the observing system. And this is the backbone of the global carbon observing system to date. An example of one of these approaches in terms of combining the data with the model is this um, model output of the pH changes uh, throughout the global oceans over time out to 2100s. And as you can see here, you can stop the model at any point in time and compare your results to, to the model results. And this is uh, one of the products that we are producing uh, at the global level now. Now, if you wanna steer in towards uh, local modeling efforts that, that, that can provide uh, information at the local scale. There are a number of different models that, that have been approached to this. This is just one example, one model from Nicholas Gruber from, from uh, ETH. And, and it uses the mo ROMS model from UCLA and ETH, uh, ETH uh, which has a resolution of about five kilometers and extends out uh, to 50 kilometer re resolution away from the site. This particular model output had an alkaline input rate of 1.6 times tens of uh, tenth moles of carbon per year. And if the rep uh, representations show the output of a single ejection at a single site about that the size of the EBCARB, EBCARB uh, outputs that are expected uh, this year and in San Francisco Bay and then uh, ejected out into the coastal California current system. And what you see is the changes in alkalinity that should be can be observed from 60 days, 90 days, and 360 days. And you can see the uh, chemical changes that are taking place spread usually north and south along the coast, and in some cases get picked up by eddies and spread offshore. Now the uh, resulting uptake of carbon dioxide is shown in the bottom panel. And you can see that the changes in carbon dioxide from this process range from about uh, zero to eight uh, parts per million of CO2 uptake. And the corresponding alkalinity increases that we see are anywhere from zero to six micromoles per kilogram, depending on the location. So this gives us a sense, if you will, of one one OAE experiment would have in our coastal region. Now, another component of uh, MERV the, is the biological component. And this is really critically important because as we add alkalinity into the ocean ecosystem, we are going to be affecting the biological system. So Nina Benarsek recently uh, did a very nice meta-analysis of all the biological studies that have taken place thus far to try and provide us some information on what the biological responses to ocean alkaline enhancement will be. And this is the results of that for a number of different groups of organisms. And what you can see in this plots is that if there is no effect at all, that would be neutral effect. That's a good thing because you're saying you're not changing the environment. But, and that happens uh, on the order of um, about 20% of all the observations. About 40% of the observations, there's a positive effect and shown here in the magenta. And there's uh, another 40%, there's a negative effect. And the negative effect, of course, we, we are, should be very concerned about and, and provide, provide more information on that. 
within each group, there are some uh, positive effects and some negative effects and some neutral effects. And that suggests that there are species differences uh, that need to be considered as well. But even with respect to positive uh, effects, you might be concerned about what that means for the ecosystem. Because if you have a very strong positive effect, that could change the, the community ecosystem response and change the community response to ocean alkalinity enhancement. So we need a lot more research on that. We need field experiments as well as laboratory experiments to address the, the uh, overall impacts that will be. And this will have to be part of the ecological uh, MRV process as well. Now, yeah, from a governmental point of view, we feel like that with the government can play a significant role in this process. And that significant role should be by private sector working together with uh, the federal government to provide a public-private uh, partnership in, in these uh, groups here then can work together through the NOP process, which do, uh, supports public-private research together. And uh, below here are the five or six different agencies of federal government that are part of the NOP process. So we feel strongly that by these partnerships, we can do more together. So in summary, then, we should start with a highly resolved biogeochemical model that can be uh, both at large scale and at, uh, at uh, fine scale, and use the model then to predict for us uh, what the changes might be in order for us to develop an integrated observing system that can measure these changes. And we would measure these changes both inside in the experimental phase and outside the control phase in order to understand the changes that are taking place. And in this process, then we would develop a monitoring and reporting process following the best practices that are, are well laid out uh, for this community and including data submission practices to our national data centers. We would then compare the results with the observations and models. This would be the verification stage. And those verification stages then would tell us what the changes have taken place uh, for any individual experiment or on the global uh, uh, environment as a whole. And finally, we can then delineate the changes that are due to natural and human impacts, including chemistry and, and, and biology. And I just wanna point you to the guide for best practices in ocean alkaline enhancement research that was just recently published um, by Copernicus Publications this past year. And it's a good place to, to understand what the scientific community is thinking about in terms of these practices. There are two particular chapters by David Hole. On, on MERV practices, uh, which are, are I have re represented here, and also uh, Li Ching Chang on uh, reporting and, and, and metadata presentations to the community. It's our general feeling that we need to be as open and transparent as we have, and everybody should realize that the observations they get, get is part of the ocean alkaline enhancement or should be part of the collective uh, observational record for the global oceans. I will stop there. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Dick. Thank you so much uh, for that tour through this topic and particularly that summary slide around how to achieve a successful mechanism for MRV uh, or ocean alkalinity enhancement. Before we turn it to our next uh, speaker, um, we're gonna launch another poll question. Um, thanks, Lauren. The next poll asks, how do you feel about ocean alkalinity and enhancement as an effective marine carbon dioxide removal strategy? And as a reminder to participants, these poll questions help us to uh, develop and and uh, in an effort to co-design our uh, webinar series, and and so we incorporate this feedback into uh, planning and and crafting our future webinars. So thank you for leading into this process. 
a little bit of uncertainty uh, and some hope. Uh, and I think we'll do, thank you for responding. I think we'll do one more poll uh, before we have Yui's presentation. Uh, here's our third poll question. What do you think should be involved in developing monitoring, reporting, and validation protocols? Who do you think should be involved? Um, so who should be most contributing to this? this process. Lauren, when you feel like we've got some responses, go ahead and show those results. Somewhat of an even spread, all hands on deck, I suppose. All right, Yui, if you want to come on video, turn your mic on and share your slides, and I'll uh, go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yui Takashida is a scientist with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and Yui's research uh, focuses around the development and application of autonomous sensing technology to observe biogeochemical cycles. Uh, and Yui received his PhD from uh, UC San Diego. Thank you, Yui. Take it away. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, and thanks uh, for uh, CCAN and California Ocean Science Trust for hosting this webinar and inviting me uh, to, to give this presentation. So um, Dick gave a really nice introduction into the MRV process of, you know, not only really um, ocean alkalinity enhancement, but I think pretty much all MCDR approaches. And it's going to be a combination of models and observation. And then so my background is um, in the observational side of things. So this presentation is really going to focus on the observations. And I assume Matt's going to focus on the model side. So it splits quite nicely. And I'm just going to preface this with that a lot of, you know, the I'm going to focus on autonomous assets, but shipboard measurements are, you know, an essential component of the observations and will always kind of form the backbone of the you know, regional and global observing systems. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. We can't we can't lose the ships. But um, like um, I was told that it's good to start start off with take home points. So the first one that I kind of wanted to um, uh, really emphasize is that ocean observations I think are a public good. You know because. It benefits not only the MCDR industry, but society as a whole in a variety of different industries, societal benefits, uh, things like that. And so, you know, these data should be um, freely available. Anyone can use it. Um, and so, and that will um, really benefit society as a whole, but they are um, underinvested. Uh, the second point, Dick also highlighted this, open and transparent data, I think will be a foundation for this, for a successful MCDR marketplace. We don't want data to be hidden behind um, firewall, you know, for example, and also the data that's collected should be um, submitted in uh, standard data formats, metadata in a way that other people can use it and synthesize so um, that we can all as a community, you know, tackle the grand challenges that Dick uh, nicely outlined. And the final thing that I really want to emphasize is that um, we, in order to meet the you know, projected growth of the MCDR industry and the MRV capabilities that need to come along with it, we really need to start expanding the capacity of the ocean observations now, you know, because it's going to take time to scale the uh, um, observing systems as well. And then so uh, if you don't start investing and growing them now, it's, you know, we because we really want the baseline conditions before the MCDR becomes, you know, um, ha to have a noticeable impact on the global scale. So, and uh, from the ocean observation size, just, you know, it's going to take years to scale up to the size and scope and, you know, maturity that we really need it to be. So, um, so we really need to start investing 
train the next generation of people to operate these observing systems, and that really needs to start today. So those are my take home points. And to kind of highlight the um, first two points, I want to kind of use this recent article that was published in The Economist, The Economist Impact, The Ocean Silent Sentinel, and how ocean observation data power marine climate change mitigation. And then so this, you know, so this is a really nice infographic. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you take a look at it. But basically their main conclusion is that, um, so they looked at a couple different sectors and uh, for, sec uh, for industries that are, related to marine um, climate change mitigation, about two thirds of that sector really depends on ocean observing data. And if you put that in dollars, it's about $34 billion. So it's a tremendous amount of money and you know value that ocean observations are providing for society. And the plot on the right here shows um, a couple different scenarios. It's basically how much these sectors grow. But basically, the conclusion was that, that by 2030, more than 90% of the sector's gross value added will rely on ocean data. And then so based on these projections, it's worth 100 to $250 billion. So ocean observations is critical to uh, for the growth and uh, for the effective um, with effect effectiveness of this industry. And if you take marine CDR um, uh, specifically, they conclude that about 56% uh, of the industry currently relies on ocean observations, and that's worth about $23 million. And uh, depending on how the CDR industry grows, you know, shown on this plot on the right, um, they can be up to worth a billion dollars. And that value is going to keep growing as the CDR industry, uh, depending on the trajectory of the CDR industry. And so, but this study also looked at a variety of different industries, so offshore wind, green shipping, ocean renewable energy, and it really has a very similar conclusions. So the plots on the left are for offshore wind, green shipping, and renewable energy projections to 2030. So offshore wind, 223 billion, green shipping, 3 billion, renewable energy, 8 billion. And the point that I'm trying to make is that the ocean observations don't only help one industry, but a variety of industries. So this is why I'm making the argument that these are really public goods, right? And it benefits society as a whole. And this study didn't uh, include other industries that really rely on ocean observations, such as fisheries management, or uh, even the you know uh, hurricane projection weather models. Um, the insurance companies really rely on sea level rise projections and guess where all that you know, information comes from, ocean observations. And so again, this is you know a public good, and we really have to treat it like that. And then this um, uh, article also you know called it the ocean data revolution. Um, and so I'm just going to read these three sentences. I know that's bad practice um, in uh, in presentations, but I think it's worth it. So despite the significant role of ocean observations in marine-based climate change mitigation efforts, the full economic potential of such data are not yet being leveraged. Only a small fraction of the data collected is actually used for productive means. I really want to highlight this last part. Without more efficient data collection and sharing, efforts to track climate change and the, important, and the impact of mitigation activities will be hindered. So that comes back to the idea of open and transparent data. It's not enough to just collect the data. It has to be um, um, documented and shared in a way that other people can find it and analyze it and synthesize it. And so this kind of goes into the reporting aspect of the MRV. Uh, Dick also touched on this, but there are you know, established standards for reporting shipboard, mooring, and uh, many autonomous vehicle data. You know, And then so rather than trying to come up with new standards, we really, I, I think it's the best idea for the MCDR community to adopt these data formats and metadata um, standards from day one. So that all the data that's collected from the pilot stage to the implementation uh, stage can be uh, openly accessed and um, People can double check your, you know, carbon, uh, carbon uptake uh, calculations and things like that. And for data streams that do not have these standardized formats, you know, we urge you to make it a priority to work with partners to establish uh, data and metadata standards so that um, the community can take advantage of that because this is critical. Okay, so uh, now going on to a little bit more of the specific specifics of the observing systems. So when I kind of think of what observations are needed for um, MRV, I kind of I think there's three stages. There is the local, you know, local set of observations, 
regional and global. And then the needs for the observing systems are very different for each of these um, uh, systems and different assets, different platforms uh, will be used. And, and it, the need to, you know, uh, and, you know, so the local stage, local, local stage of observations will likely correspond to the, like the pilot stage. And then when it becomes, I'm just, you know, like bigger, like megatons, you know, I'm just making these numbers up, it might, you know, then we really have to start, you know, the regional observing assets and networks are going to become important. And when it becomes gigatons and, you know, noticeable in the global carbon budgets, then we really need the global observing system. So kind of as the MCDR um, industry scales, these observing networks, um, the reliance on these um, different observing networks will change as well. And then so if we start with the local first, um, I thought Dick was going to present this paper, but this is a paper um, that was published last uh, or two years ago at this point. So this was a model study um, simulating uh, alkalinity release in the Bering Sea. And then so this is a continuous release over a year, I believe. And so the contour plot on the left here shows the change in alkalinity at the surface um, uh, over the whole area. And then the depth transects along this line here. Uh, the change in alkalinity. And then so you can see that, you know, once you get away from the source, the the, the signal really attenuates really quickly. So you're only seeing a two micromole uh, change, you know, if you get 100 kilometers, 50 kilometers away. And then so uh, the uh, the impacts of or the noticeable chemical changes in after uh, adding alkalinity really is the the signal is going to be the strongest at the local site and then gets attenuated really quickly. So while you're doing kind of these pilot studies, you really want to focus on capturing the, um, uh, the changes in chemistry on really small time scales. So taking an example of a pilot study that I believe is taking place right now, uh, this is a collaboration between Ed Carbon and PNNL. So they are planning to do um, alkalinity enhancement in Sequim Bay up here in uh, near Puget Sound. And then so in a semi-enclosed bay like this, you know, so if you have an alkalinity release down here, then you, you know, kind of want to look at, you know, you may want to have a couple moorings along here uh, and then combine it with uh, a very, um, very localized model and then compare the model results to these localized um, observing systems. And then so you can, and then so something like this, so you really want to focus on how the alkalinity is getting in, uh, getting transported across the bay, how the CO2 fluxes are corresponding. Um, and then the biological impacts, you really want to focus on realistic um, changes in carbonate chemistry. Even along this bay, you'll have a strong attenuation of the alkalinity single signal. So you want to make sure that your biological uh, studies uh, correspond to realistic um, alkalinity changes in the water column. Um, so that's kind of in a semi-enclosed bay, but if it's a, a lot of places on the West Coast are pretty exposed to um, the ocean. So this is another study. This was published last year. So they uh, tried to look at, um, uh, they use the model to try to understand the impacts of nutrient discharge from, um, you know, the big cities in Southern California. So that's, you know, it's not exactly the same as, you know, alkalinity enhancement, but it's kind of similar as you know, point discharge or several of them. And then you're trying to see the impact of what that does in a more, you know, in a larger area. And then so the plot that plot on the left shows a change in primary production. So this is phytoplankton growth uh, across this um, uh, across this domain. So you can see that the impacts around here are you know, largest around the big um, major metropolitan area, as you would expect. But you have these kind of offshore impacts that um, are that were uh, observed in the models and kind of as a consequence, you saw changes in pH. So now the plot on the right shows the effective change in pH due to this enhanced productivity. And then so this is the kind of thing, a similar study you can imagine being done with alkalinity. So once alkalinity is you know, um, released, how much extra CO2 did the model think it took up? Did it have changes in productivity? And did it have any subsurface impacts on ocean chemistry? And so the models are going to be really important to that. But you know, these uh, to in order to kind of validate and uh, make sure that the model outputs are trustworthy, you know, and accurate. We want to make sure that there are observations that kind of corroborate and validate the models. And then um, along the coast, uh, the observations, uh, particularly in pH, are pretty scarce uh, to uh, constrain these models and validate them. Okay, so now going on to uh, more of the regional scale. So there are, um, you know, regional models that uh, run all along the coast of our. Uh, our West Coast, you know, so Dick showed one of those examples. Um, 
And so here is a snapshot of all of the um, observing assets we have for CO2 chemistry. You know, so this, uh, and then so you can see a lot of these moorings, and then these are ship tracks for underway PCO2 and stuff. So, you know, I think you can kind of see that along the whole uh, West Coast, uh, a lot of them are pretty coastal. Uh, there's not a lot of observations offshore, and a lot of these are mostly surface. And then so we really are interested in not only how the surface dynamics are changing, but what's happening underneath the surface as well, because that's going to help um, understand where the carbon went after it was uptaken by the ocean. And so kind of to enhance uh, the, these observational capacities, one autonomous platform that I think is going to be really important to kind of observe at the regional scale are underwater gliders. And then so I think Dick referred to these as uh, steerable profiling systems, I think, you know, and so um, so these are a couple flavors of underwater gliders, but basically they can change um, uh, their buoyancy so they can go up and down in the water column. And then because they have wings that provides lift and then that allows them to kind of move in the horizontal direction. So as they dive, they move forwards and then they come up, they send data and then they go back down. So you can navigate uh, where they where you want them to go from shore. And there's actually a pretty um, significant underwater glider network along um, the coast of the U.S. and, you know, in the West Coast. This is a snapshot of all of the glider data that was reported to the IUS um, Glider Data Assembly Center in 2023. So you can see that, you know, so if you're trying to observe and model the, um, you know, the West Coast, there are a lot of these glider data that can help um, uh, constrain and validate these models. But the kind of problem with the gliders is that uh, as of right now, there's not uh, a commercially available option for uh, P, uh, the, some of the key parameters that we want to measure, like pH. And so we're trying to address that um, through work um, through our lab and funded by the Ocean Acidification um, uh, Program at NOAA. And so kind of giving an idea of how these glider observations can improve model performance, this is an example. So this is in collaboration with the UC Santa Cruz Ocean Modeling Group. And so in a 2019 run, so we, you know, we had a glider transect that went out about 250 kilometers from uh, Monterey Bay. And so you can see the transect there and the observations of, uh, from our gliders. And if you compare that to the standard run uh, uh, for the, the, the ROMS model from UC Santa Cruz, this plot here shows the difference between the glider observations and the model observation. So you can see that the model um, overestimates pH uh, near the coast and underestimates it offshore. But then if you assimilate the glider data, uh, then as you would expect, the model uh, output pH agrees with the observations quite nicely. But what is also, I think, you know, really interesting from this is that just by simulating this one transect, the surface pH, it had an impact on surface pH you know, pretty much everywhere in the domain, but, you know, uh, but quite strongly in the coast, you know, so you can see that just by simulating this one transect, the surface pH down at Point Conception, for example, changed by about 0.1. And, you know, the ocean is all connected, right? And that's if you tune and change one part of the ocean, it has downstream effects. So that's where, I, you know, so this, I think, is a really nice example of how, uh, how these observations can really help improve the model performance. And obviously, we have to have the pH so both surface and subsurface correct to be able to accurately model the impacts of alkalinity enhancement, right? So um, we're working hard to try to expand these capabilities um, in both the West and the East Coast. You wait just two or three more minutes, okay? Okay, great. Thanks. I just want to go for the global. So if once, you know, if MCDR gets to a global scale, um, what kind of observing system do we need? You know, and then so this is a slide from Dick's presentation. Ships are always going to be the backbone um, of these um, global observing systems. So the SOCAT data set is the surface ocean PCO2 uh, map. So you can you can ingest all this, train in a neural network or other app machine learning algorithms and create monthly CO2 flux maps and see how that's changing over time. So that's one example of how you know we will be able to observe um, CO2 flux changes um, on a global scale. But that really only tells us the surface changes. And then so what we really want are subsurface and so I think for that, the most effective observing network is the Argo program. So Dick mentioned this as well. These are profiling platforms that go from the surface to depth, uh, 2,000 uh, meters for most. Um, there are newer, deeper floats that go to the full ocean depth. But this is a map from yesterday. There are 4,000 of these floats uh, measuring temperature and salinity. And for example, what you 
can do with a float with flows like this. So this is a map from the Argo website, just uh, showing the change in ocean heat content, so change in temperature from the surface to 2,000 meters over the past two decades. And this is an incredible plot because you can this is you can just see how the ocean is absorbing heat from the surface all the way to 2,000 meters. So what I, and and I would argue that what we really need is an observing system that can replicate this for carbon. If you want to do M, the MRV um, correctly for uh, these MCDR approaches, because we really need to know how the carbon inventories are changing over the whole water column um, globally. And to do that, uh, there is a, uh, a branch of Argo called Biogeochemical Argo. So these are equipped with um, uh, six different um, biogeochemical sensors. And for this uh, talk, the pH would be most relevant, but there's also oxygen nitrate that can tell us ecosystem impacts, how deoxygenation is changing, chlorophyll fluorescence, backscatter radiance that can tell us if um, primary productivity is changing, nitrate to see if uh, nutrient distributions are changing. And so there is, you know, there's a lot of momentum behind biogeochemical Argo. Here's a map of um, where the current floats that have at least four sensors on them are located around the world. Uh, there's about 420 of them, and about that's only about 40% of what we need. And then so this, again, kind of going, you know, taking it back to the point that, you know, this is years of effort trying to scale this up, and we still have many more years to go to try to get the target of about 1,000 floats that we really need. So the take-home points revisited. Ocean observations are public good. I hope that I, you know, that you take I did you take a look at the, ec the Economist uh, article. It really benefits not only the MCDR industry but society as a whole. Uh, we really need to make the data open and transparent for this um, industry to be successful, and we really need to start expanding the capacity of ocean observations now at the local, regional, and also global scale. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yui. Great presentation. And I think we'll have a chance to revisit some of those uh, take home points during the q and A. I I want to go ahead and turn it over to Matt Long. Uh, he's the co-founder and executive director of Seaworthy, a nonprofit research organization focused on building the tools needed to ensure safe, effective uh, carbon-based uh, carbon dioxide removal. Um, in particular, Seaworthy is developing modeling and data assimilation infrastructure to provide robust monitoring, reporting, and verification of ocean-based uh, CDR. And uh, Matt has been a scientist and researcher with the Climate and Global Dynamics Lab at the National Center for uh, Atmospheric Research. Uh, and I see you're on, and uh, and so take it away, Matt. Thank you. Great. You see my slides? Is that what you mean by on? Yep. Great. I look great. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that introduction, and thanks for inviting me to speak today. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing at Seaworthy along the dimensions of developing tools to support MRV. Um, before I start uh, with that, I'd just like to give a little bit of background on this institution because it is a new institution. Um, Seaworthy is a, a nonprofit research organization. Um, our mission is to build scientifically supported software to quantify the efficacy of ocean carbon dioxide removal and to explicitly support systems for monitoring, reporting, and verification. Um, we have a collection of value uh, values that we hold as central to our operation. Um, we're a nonprofit because it enables us to be a neutral arbiter of scientific credibility. Um, we're committed to open science, and I uh, applaud the um, emphasis that UE put on data transparency. Um, we're scientifically driven explicitly in the context of the um, of the open questions that remain in ocean carbon cycle science and a commitment to uh, enabling market markets to grow uh, on the basis of science that's available now, but to uh, improve that science over time and to ensure that the market is um, tracking the best available science. We are community oriented. We recognize that the challenges inherent in ocean constraining ocean carbon dioxide removal are diverse and require an interdisciplinary community, um, and that it's re really critical to establish community consensus on best practices and, um, and standardized tools. But finally, we are commercially relevant in the sense that 
We recognize value in the private sector's entrepreneurial spirit and capacity for innovation. And one of our goals fundamentally is to bridge the gap between academic research and commercially relevant tools so as to enable the MCDR industry to grow um, explicitly in the context of the urgency of the climate crisis. Um, moving to some of the technical uh, technical perspective on some of the challenges associated with MRV, um, we have been thinking about this in the context of a explicit scale separation. And in particular, uh, we've delineated this sort of nominal uh, discretization of three scales, the first being the near field. This is the scale at which deployments might occur. And these are uh, processes operating on scales of meters to tens to hundreds of meters. Observations are directly relevant because signals here are re relatively strong. Moving up in scale is the local regional scale. This is the initial scale at which signals disperse. And again, observations have a strong role to play in constraining the processes here. Um, and then finally, the region to basin scale where um, in many cases, a lot of the gas exchange processes that's actually mediating ocean carbon dioxide removal um, is occurring. Um, I'm gonna just present a, a vignette at this larger scale and then move to some uh, shorter examples um, at the local scale. So first of all, it's important to recognize why models are critical for MRV systems. And one of the key challenges is that the spatial scales involved with something like an ocean alkalinity enhancement deployment are very large. What I'm showing here is a, is a, a movie that represents the, at the, in the top panel, the PCO2, surface ocean PCO2 anomaly associated with an alkalinity injection off the coast of West Africa. And what you can see is that over a period of 15 years, this signal spreads to comprise um, an anomaly over the entire North Atlantic basin. In the lower left panel, you see that the uptake continues to increase and has indeed not saturated by the end of that 15 year simulation. Part of the reason that the uptake has not reached its thermodynamic maximum is because much of the alkalinity has been advected to depth. Um, the, so models are, are important because of these large spatial uh, and temporal scales. Um, but also because the signals to noise ratios at these large scales are very unfavorable. There's a lot of background variability and the attribution to a particular um, MCDR deployment is challenged. But then more fundamentally, that attribution and a computation of a net carbon removal amount requires computing fluxes relative to a counterfactual baseline. And that counterfactual baseline is in principle impossible to observe directly from observations, though you could imagine developing analog arguments. It's hard to see how that, uh, that careful crafting of analog arguments is a scalable solution um, to supporting MRV as the industry scales. What I'd like to do now is um, present a few uh, highlights from a paper that we submitted recently entitled Mapping the Global Variation and the Efficiency of Ocean Alkalinity Enhancement for Ocean Carbon Dioxide Removal. This was led by a graduate student at the University of Connecticut, Ben Yang, and um, had significant contributions from Mike Taika at Google. Um, the thing that we did in this paper, we sought to map out the distribution of uh, ocean alkalinity enhancement efficiency uh, over the global domain. So the first step in approaching this analysis was to divide the domain, the global domain into a set of regions, which are shown here um, with enhanced resolution in coastal regions comprising the exclusive economic zones. Um, in each of these regions, we applied a delta function pulse of alkalinity for a one month period um, during uh, each of the four seasons. So that pulse of alkalinity was the key OAE forcing. And then we integrated the model forward to represent the distribution or the, the entrainment of that alkalinity in the, in the oceanographic flow. We can integrate over the air-sea flux of that alkalinity plume to compute the total change in the carbon inventory. And that gives us something like a characteristic uptake curve that is the uh, CDR associated with that alkalinity deployment Normalizing that curve to the amount of alkalinity that we put into the ocean gives this sort of efficiency metric eta. Um, here are uh, some maps showing the results of this computation applied globally to each of these regions. So the upper left panel, panel A, shows the efficiency of OAE on a scale from about uh, 0.3 to 0.9 
uh, globally distributed after um, five years of deployment. What you can see is that there's some significant spatial variance in the efficiency at this time scale with enhanced efficiency, for example, in the North Pacific and in the subpolar Southern Ocean and reduced efficiency actually in the center of subpolar uh, subtropical gyres. Um, as the simulations progress to 15 years, some aspect of this spatial variance is erased as a, a lot of the regions that were responding slowly sort of catch up. But we see that high latitude regions, for example, in the uh, continental shelf seas of Antarctica or the subpolar North Atlantic, um, maintain low efficiency due to the energetic vertical mixing that happens during the winter um, in those regions. Um, there's a variety of different behaviors in this simulation, and here we've highlighted four um, sort of representative regions following a transect uh, uh, or a just sort of anomaly north to south in the North Atlantic. So the top panel is in the Labrador Sea, top panels are in the Labrador Sea. And what we see in this region is that uptake either happens relatively quickly, as illustrated in the red line, representative of a summertime condition, or it doesn't happen at all, illustrated by the blue line, um, in which represents deployment of alkalinity in the winter. Um, if we move down to the second row, the Gulf of St. Lawrence is a region where there's relatively strong stratification and high wind speeds driving rapid gas exchange. And this is an, an area that is exempt, exemplified by very low seasonality in the uptake curve um, and, uh, and very rapid response in the uptake. Um, in the subtropical North Atlantic, the situation is different. I showed you uh, a, a movie of this region where the uptake starts out slow and just sort of keeps chugging as the alkalinity is entrained into the subtropical overturning circulation and keeps re-emerging um, at the surface uh, in those shallow overturning cells. And then finally, in the tropics is sort of an intermediate case where um, there's very little seasonality. The uptake happens kind of at an intermediate time scale, but does manage to saturate by the time the 15-year simulation is done. Notably, uh, a theme of these data is the large spatial and temporal scales involved. And these plots illustrate the fraction of uptake that occurs within a particular distance threshold. So for example, the top map shows the fraction of uptake that occurs within 500 kilometers, the middle within 1,000 kilometers, and the bottom within 2,000 kilometers. Um, what you see from these maps is that very small fractions of the ocean uh, have the majority of uptake occurring within 500 kilometers, say. So this is a challenge basically for the attribution problem and, and really highlights the, the critical role that observations, or sorry, that models have to play in the context of the MRV challenge. As we move out to the, the 2000 kilometer threshold, you see that a large regions in the, in the mid to high latitudes um, are saturated, but it, uh, it, the tropics remain um, incomplete even at the 2000 meter, uh, 2000 kilometer uh, distance horizon. Um, one of the things we are doing with this data set is um, calling it uh, the Ocean CD or the MCDR Atlas, and we are working in collaboration with Carbon Plan to produce a uh, interactive uh, data explorer where uh, users can log on to the Carbon Plan website and um, explore these data using a graphical user interface, as well as provide um, access to downloading data layers. We think this is a really exciting data set because it comprises um, both a wealth of information that can be used to investigate the mechanisms controlling OAE efficiency and motivate conversations about how frameworks might work for uh, carbon accounting um, built into these data or whether or not you believe the actual model simulation built into these data is the mechanistic response of the ocean system. And so there's a lot of information that we can use to structure conversations about um, how to develop appropriate accounting standards. We also think that these characteristic uptake curves, the plot center, uh, uh, the central center plan panel here, do provide an access point to uh, supporting low cost MRV systems in the sense that these can provide a, um, a, a, something called a greens function or a, a convolution integral kernel that can be convolved with any arbitrary alkalinity forcing at a particular um, release location to compute uh, uptake from a continuous release. The 
assumptions behind the application of these characteristic uptake curves in this setting do include uh, an, an, assume, an assumption of linearity. And um, it, we know the carbon carbonate system is non-linear. So understanding the, the boundaries of that linearity assumption and its validity is one of the things that we're, we're looking at now. Um, for, for reasonably small perturbations, uh, for example, in uh, for less than 500 micromoles per kilogram of alkalinity, the system actually is sufficiently linear. And so the chemistry is not a limitation on the application of this method. Um, another question related to these data sets are the use of a coarse resolution model to represent the uh, air-C flux anomaly associated with an alkalinity release. And so one of the key questions is whether the results continue to hold as we reduce or increase the resolution of the model to resolve more of the mesoscale and sub-mesoscale dynamics, particularly the sub-mesoscale, which mediate energetic exchange, vertical exchange in the upper ocean. We're pursuing this work now at Seaworthy, led by Elizabeth Yankovsky, and here's some early results from a 25 kilometer um, uh, uh, configuration of the ROMS model showing an alkalinity release off San Francisco and the ensuing uh, DIC anomaly simulated. The initial results in, from this particular configuration of the model show quite a uh, strong degree of correspondence with the global course resolution model, but we're continuing to investigate how uh, resolution impacts the results overall. Okay, so I showed you a very quick uh, tour, a very quick tour. I apologize for um, not lingering as long as some of you may have liked on some of those figures um, of this regional to basin scale uh, dynamic. I'd like to just move a little bit to the local scale and really just provide some motivation for the application of models to problems at this scale. So one of our access points at Seaworthy is uh, to, 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 to high resolution regional modeling is, um, is motivated by our engagement in two different field trials. The first is in a fjord in Iceland um, that we're starting to work on in collaboration with the Carbon to Sea Initiative. And then the second is um, one that is funded by the NOAA NOP program um, to occur at a wastewater treatment plant in San Francisco Bay. Um, the Iceland field trial is in this fjord in Iceland, just north of Reykjavik, and um, this region was chosen because of its fairly, fairly retentive properties, the idea being that we could release alkalinity into this system and have it stick around uh, long enough to um, make some significant observations of both the chemical and ecological response. Um, we built a ROMS modeling system for this uh, for this fjord and are integrating that model at 33 meter resolution. Um, here are some um, some just uh, representative results from that model where we've introduced a, an alkalinity anomaly at the surface, uh, illustrated uh, at the surface in the top plot, and the associated and are simulating the associated pH and PCO2 change or air sea flux changes. Sorry, in the in the two lower panels. Our objectives with this model are really to characterize the flow in the fjord so as to understand the residence time. We're using that information to help uh, with permitting conversations so that we can actually explicitly simulate expected pH excursions and then guide the monitoring strategy as we design our observational campaign to, to um, both release the alkalinity and capture its effects um, using shipboard sampling. And then finally, um, we aim to leverage the observational data that we collect as well as it, during the, the field experiment, as well as during the background um, data collection phase. So as to va further validate the model and uh, you know address any deficiencies in the modeling system with respect to its physical or biogeochemical representation of the dynamics, uh, so as to ensure that we have a consistent picture of how the ocean responds to ocean alkalinity enhancement deployments. The second field trial that we're engaged in occurs at this wastewater treatment plant that is pictured here in the foreground. This is the San Francisco Bay Area and we're looking due west. San Francisco is um, on the horizon there with the Bay Bridge extending um, out to Yerba Buena and Treasure Island. Um, our plan for this experiment is to actually introduce sodium hydroxide into the wastewater treatment plant effluent stream uh, and uh, the, the outfall pipe uh, discharges, um, the outfall pipe runs out into the center of San Francisco Bay about a mile and discharges um, at about 14 meters depth, just south of Treasure Island. 
Um, our goals are include tagging the uh, alkalinity with sulfur hexafluoride and tracking its fate in the tidally influenced bay system. Um, we're building a modeling system for this uh, for the San Francisco Bay based on ROMs, and we'll use that high resolution modeling system to simulate the experiment in advance of our release to again help design the deployment and observational strategy, and then provide basically the backbone for a system that could uh, be used to underpin an MRV uh, framework for uh, alkalinity release in this system. Just okay, a couple so more I'm... minutes, Matt. Let's try How it many? out. Uh, just two more. Okay, perfect. So what I've given you is a, is a very uh, rapid tour of some thoughts on this local to regional scales. I'll just use the remaining time to talk a little bit about um, some two sort of important components uh, related to the infrastructure. So first of all, a gigaton scale um, ocean CDR industry is a thing that is unprecedented. And we sort of recognize a requirement to kind of up our game collectively in the space of oceanographic modeling so as to be able to support a commercial sector. With funding from ARPA-E, the DOE ARPA-E program, we're developing a modeling system called CSTAR that is comprised of ocean general circulation models coupled to um, biogeochemical, uh, ocean biogeochemical codes. Um, right now, we're, you're, we're using uh, ROMs and MARBLE for those two core components. But one of the things that we're seeking to address is all the technical bottlenecks that arise in deploying regional models to do calculations related to MCDR. And so we're building modeling infrastructure and uh, workflow tools that support deploying models and explicitly seeking to identify appropriate standard opportunities for standardization of these models so that there is uh, uh, access to fungibility across um, across uh, carbon removal deployments and standardization um, that enables the market to move forward. Um, we are actively engaged in uh, uh, discussions with the nascent carbon removal industry, um, including buyers and, and registries, um, as well as ocean CDR suppliers, seeking to uh, identify the requirements for modeling systems to support the specific use cases, and then also um, build towards uh, frameworks that um, underpin appropriate standards for MRV and explicitly carbon accounting. Um, this is a really uh, sort of challenging space, but super exciting to see multiple sectors of, of society come together um, to develop uh, the new regulatory frameworks that will um, underpin uh, an MCDR industry. And our hope really is that by coming by by sort of building science and credible credible science and strong engagement with the academic research sector in at the ground floor of this process, we can ensure that the industry is based on credible and uh, adaptable scientific principles moving forward. Um, and that's all I have uh, for today. So I appreciate your attention and happy to take questions during the Q and A. Great, Matthew, thank you so much uh, for that wonderful presentation, many new uh, activities happening. Uh, so great to keep our community in the loop. Uh, I'll invite on my uh, co-convener today, Darcy from the Alaska uh, Observing System and OA Network. She will help moderate the Q&A uh, portion of today's webinar. If I could also ask uh, the three panelists to turn your cameras on and unmute yourselves uh, for this panel Q&A. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Alex. Hi, everybody. We've had some really great questions come in over the course of these presentations, um, and we'll start digging into some of those now. Let's start with a question about observations and models. Um, this question is about how should one characterize the uncertainties inherent in the mismatch between models and measurements on a local scale? And how might such uncertainties affect the inferred amount of MCDR? Does anyone want to pick that up? Um, I can speak to that. It's not a 
the solution to that problem is not obvious by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, I think first of all, the valid the, the approach to validating models is really an art, not a science at, at this point. And oftentimes we deem models accept acceptable on the basis of sort of, sort of multiple lines of corroborating evidence. Um, it, and so that's sort of a dissatisfying uh, approach to um, something, you know, to, to, to be amenable, for example, to something like standardization. Uncertainty quantification is a huge topic and it has lots of nuanced facets. I think it's worth pointing out that we don't actually observe directly the key quantity of interest which would be something like the air sea flux. We observe tracer distributions in the ocean. And so there's a requirement at best, we observe tracer distributions. Sometimes we observe proxies like pH and, and uh, make an assumption about alkalinity, for example, to compute DIC. Um, we need to be able to have a direct a mapping of those uh, observations to the quantity of interest, which might be the air sea flux. Um, and so it's a very challenging uh, uh, sort of dynamic. Um, and, and so in the context of uncertainty, we need to sort of have partitioning uh, of uncertainty into the various buckets that contribute, for example, structural uncertainty, parameter, par parametric uncertainty, um, intrinsic uncertainty, and um, have uh, sort of nuanced approaches for attacking each of those categories. Uh, that's probably not a very satisfying answer, but that's those are some thoughts in that direction. Thank you, Matt. Yes, that's a, a big, uh, complicated, multifaceted topic. So thanks for that input. Um, my next question, I think, that came in here is probably for Dick. Um, this is a question on data quality. Do you think the observation data quality goals for OAE will be similar to the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network? Go on. Yes, I do. Uh, it, the, it's clear from the modeling that Matt just showed us is that the changes that we are expecting to see in the oceans are small relative to the uncertainties that we have uh, due to natural variability. So that requires high quality measurements in order to discern those changes as best we can. And, and as I mentioned, the shipboard measurements provide us with the best uh, quality measurements. So what we'll end up having to do is to utilize those shipboard measurements to help uh, refine the quality of the uh, autonomous measurements. And you, we do this by developing empirical relationships between the shipboard measurements and autonomous measurements, and therefore, uh, provide a, a quality control on the autonomous measurements. And that's been very effective. We've published many papers on that approach and we're doing so within the BGC Argo community. So I think this will be the, the approach that we will be taking in the future, but it requires the highest quality measurements possible. Great, thank you, Dick. Um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about roles in this expanding field. What's the role of nonprofits like Seaworthy and government-funded research in MRV, and how can entities work together to improve outcomes? Um, I can provide my perspective on on that. Um, you know, we uh, I, I was a scientist, or still I'm a scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and. One of the things that I noted in that position was that the uh, mission of the institution was really strongly oriented towards Earth system modeling, for example, but not uh, not sufficiently uh, well enough funded or uh, capable of adapting, changing directions to develop a really targeted program to support this sort of emergent field of ocean CDR. And so one of our founding our goals in founding Seaworthy is to have a, a, a new institution with a sort of a fresh perspective that is focused exclusively on the requirements of building modeling systems uh, fast for the emerging industry and try to keep up with the requirements of new companies and new regular, you know, new, new regulatory considerations in this space. Um, and ultimately, we are scoping our particular effort as a finite term effort where 
what we what we uh, perceive is that the the infrastructure that will ultimately support MRV um, needs to be publicly funded and needs to have strong government support. But our goals then are to really work collaboratively with our colleagues in in NOAA and other agencies to um, both you know co-design the systems that we're building and also identify sort of succession planning so that as um, the prototypes become more mature, there's a home for their long-term maintenance and support moving forward. Thank you, Matt. And now I'll maybe shift this question to Dick of, of what is the role of NOAA in MRV right now or in the future? Yeah, NOAA feels like the it's... Um primary goal should be to maintain and build the carbon observing system, both atmospheric and oceanic, in order to provide a better understanding of the ocean carbon sources and sinks uh, at large scale, and, and therefore provide the background information that's required to compare against these individual experiments that are occurring. And to do so, that we'll have to expand the observing system quite a bit to, to address the needs of the various ocean acidification experiments that might, um, ocean alkalinity enhancement experiments that might take place. So that means we would have to expand the observing system and, and, and be prepared to address the needs of the community. At the same time, the uh, Centers, uh, National Center for Environmental Information will be uh, put in a situation where they can uh, take in data from the large scale observations that would have to take place and provide that information and distribute it to the community. And the fisheries centers uh, throughout uh, all of NOAA uh, thinks that can provide a very strong role in developing understanding of the biological implications of ocean alkalinity enhancement as well. And so there is a number of different approaches uh, that that uh, various line organizations of NOAA think that they can provide. Great, thank you, Dick. I think we have time for one or two more questions. I think this one will be for Yui. There's still a lot of uncertainty around MCDR and the effectiveness of its implementation on a large scale. Um, and we're wondering if you can speak to the level of certainty that we can achieve around the time scale of sequestration for any given intervention, in addition to measuring an absolute change that results. So, hmm. so the time scale question, I think, is more of a modeling question. You know, it's really about, you know, so once if alkalinity is enhanced, the CO2 uptake is going to happen for a really long time, and that's a thermodynamic you know, property. It's not for other biological MCDR approaches. You have to think about, you know, the depth at which, you know, the, you know, uh, the phytoplankton or algae was respired and then how soon that water comes back up to the surface. But alkalinity enhancement doesn't have that problem. So once CO2 is uptaken for purposes, you know, for, you know, markets and stuff, you know, it's in there for thousands of years. So time scale is not that big of an issue, I think, you know, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but uh, in terms of, you know, being able to measure the absolute change, you know, the biggest challenge of this is, you know, a lot of the figures that Matt showed is that the changes that we're going to see, you know, for any of these pilot, and even most of these regional ones are below the detection limit of any analytical capabilities we have, even in like the best of the shipboard and instrumentation. So that's where we're really, really going to have to rely on the models. And then so for alkalinity, enhancement, it's really about how long that, you know, that parcel of water that the alkalinity was released into stays in contact with the atmosphere. The CO2 exchange is based on, you know, it's fairly well understood thermodynamics and kinetics. And then so we can rely on that. We don't have to, you know, worry about biological variability and stuff. So that part, I think, is a pretty robust part of the modeling, you know, a problem. So, you know, so we're never, like, until we get to, like, really large scale where we're perturbing the global carbon cycle in like a noticeable way, like actually changing atmospheric CO2, I don't think we're really going to be able to observe the changes in the ocean chemistry unless it's at the very local scale. So that's why these, you know, 
these observing systems really is about, you know, making sure that the model, you know, like the other parameters, the key, you know, surface mixing, heat surface fluxes, heat fluxes, you know, general circulations, all that's getting properly um, captured by the models. And that's kind of how I see in specifically for OAE, that's what I see the observing systems role for the near, you know, for the near future. Great, thank you. Thank you all for these thoughtful answers to the questions. We got a lot more questions than we're able to answer today, but if your question wasn't answered, we are compiling all of these and they help us think about how to structure um, topics and content for our future webinars. We're gonna, um, before we close, we have two final poll questions we are hoping that you will stay around for because this is important information for us for future webinars. This next one is which sources of MCDR information are you using to learn about or track MCDR? Um, and you can select more than one here. All right. Let's see if we can check the results for that one. Okay, so a pretty good spread. Um, webinars like this and academic articles with some of the other ones in uh, following in hot pursuit. So it's nice to see that spread, thank you. And then our last question um, is, we're trying to do a, a better job of understanding our audience and kind of the level of detail that you're looking for here. Um, so let us know if the level of detail today was about what you were hoping for. Okay, let's check that too. All right, good job speakers. <laughs> Um, it looks like pretty close to the mark there. Um, I want to thank our speakers once again. I want to thank all of you for attending this webinar today, and we would welcome any feedback, um, further questions or suggestions for topics for the webinar series. And you'll be able to find a recording um, available on the CCAN website, the Alaska Ocean Acidification Network website, or the OST websites. And we'll be sending an email announcing the next webinar. Um, likely in May, or right, we'll send the announcement earlier, but we'll likely have a webinar in May. Um, so thank you, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you next time.